Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. I am sitting across from my good friend, Gary Hershorn. How are you doing, Gary? Very well today. Thank I'm you. I'm really uh, super pumped to have you on the uh, podcast today. Uh, we've had you on, we've had you here in the hot seat before. Correct. Um, so if anybody wants to look back on your previous talk where you talk about your entire career, we're going to go over pretty, pretty much all that stuff again, but I'm going to be quit, you know, talking to you, you know, asking you questions right. throughout it. Um, check out photobrigade.com slash live for all of our live events, other podcasts, um, and so on. Uh, and also, please subscribe to our uh, YouTube page, Photo Brigade YouTube. We're going to be putting out all sorts of really cool content uh, over the next year. Um, really, really cool stuff. I can't wait to tell you guys more about it. Um, but before we get to you, Gary, I just need to say a quick sure. thank you to Adorama uh, and their event space for allowing us to record our podcasts here uh, weekly. Um, Adorama.com slash events to see more of what they do. They do a lot of our, our photo brigade events, but they also have a lot of other events on a daily basis. Um, come into the store and check it out or check them out online. Um, thank you to Canon Professional Services. You guys rock. Um, for supporting what we do here, um, as well as Temba Bags. They always make a, they make a, mean, a mean camera bag. Check out their new line, the Cooper Collection. Okay, so with no further ado, I, I move to Gary. Gary, so how, how are things with you? What's, what's new? What's cracking? Ah, things are good. I, I, it's a new year. It's uh, new opportunities. Happy it's, New Year. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Same to you. Good. Did you do anything exciting for the, the holidays? Uh, I was just up in Toronto for a week and a half. Oh, right. Because you're originally from Canada. I am, yes. Okay, great. Yes, yes. And um, I got to shoot uh, a moonrise. One of my, well, of course uh, One did. of the things I always wanted to do was shoot a moonrise over the skyline in Toronto. And, and we happened to have a Christmas Day moonrise. A very oh, did special you? one last uh, uh, Christmas. So. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, I want to talk a bit about your background, and I'm thinking that while we do this, I'm just going to go ahead. You gave me a folder of your Gary Hirshhorn old folder old. is what, what you call yes. it, which is sort old. of a, a bit of um, your career highlights. Um, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk about, because you've been for the past has it been 30 years, three decades now? 36 years. 36 years. 36 Holy years moly. in the wires, yeah. Wow, and, for the uh, wires. And professionally shooting, yeah. Yeah, so you are what they call a veteran photographer. Grizzled. <laughs> What'd you say, grizzled? Grizzled Grizzled veteran. photographer. Um, and so I want to talk about that because you, you, you really got your start when you were a teenager, well, 18 or so, right, if I remember correctly. I, I, I started shooting my first pictures when I was 19 at the student newspaper at, at York University. In and Toronto. and uh, just since we have this photo up on the screen, I remember you saying this is one of your like this is that, your moment. That was my uh, that was my breakout picture. In, in all honesty, that was shot I think in like 1980, uh -huh. uh, and it was uh, uh, it was like my breakout picture. Everybody has a picture that they can refer to as the one that people took notice of, and that yeah. was it. Uh, so tell me a little bit about this. We're looking for people that aren't watching. We're looking at this uh, great this was, action shot. This was uh, in the early days of the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, uh, baseball. They started in 77. This was uh, their third year in existence. They're playing the Yankees. Greg Nettles, famous Yankee third baseman, was known for his diving. Uh, I, I, I started shooting baseball in Toronto at a time when the average photographer put a camera on a tripod, aimed it at second base with a cable release, sat down, had a coffee, and pushed the button. Oh, okay. And so, I, you know, I was this, uh, you know, this young punk that came in. Uh, I, I started using this. This picture was shot with a 500 mirror lens. Mirror lens. Mirror yeah. These are really short, stubby. Correct. And it was a fixed fixed uh, aperture at F8. Oh, okay. And you use it during the day, and, and it had a, a focal, uh, sorry, it had a depth of field of about one millimeter. Wow. You were in or you weren't. Yeah. And, and I, I, I got this picture. It, uh, it got great notice uh, on the UPI picture desk uh -huh. in New York. Uh -huh. and, and one of the great editors on the desk, Larry DeSantis, was a big baseball fan. And he saw that it won, I think, UPI's Picture of the Month award or something uh -huh. like that, or Picture of the Week, about $25. And, and that was it. $25. I was off and running. Nice. I was off and running <laughs> back in 1980, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to scroll, and, sure. and you're going to see just like tons of, uh, you know, these are lots of scans, too, because, you know, you don't necessarily have the full res files of all your old photos. Well, I, I, I have prints, a lot of oh, prints. Yeah, prints. You know, back in the day, this was a wire photo. You can see the caption on the side. And this is how they would, they'd have all the, the captions and everything. Correct. Here. That picture was wrapped on a drum, oh, right. and it turned around, and a little light 
read the print. It took eight minutes to send a picture from uh, from the photographer to the picture desk in New York at Man. UPI, and then they sent it out to their clients. Another eight minutes out to the clients. So. Interesting. You know, I was I was um, speaking of this, and, and maybe this is. This was maybe before, or no, this must have been much, much further. This is 1982. Correct. But my brother, who now is in the real estate business, but he worked at uh, Knight Ritter Tribune. Mm -hmm. And yes. I remember when he lived in the basement of my mom's house when I was just a kid. It was in the 90s, early 90s. And he was actually remotely running the Knight Ritter service from right. the basement. And it was a huge deal because we were watching the World Series, and we were able to. He was able to put on the homepage of Knight Ritter the opening pitch by the second inning or something like wow, that. And it was yeah. like, holy cow, that was a really big deal back then. Well, back in those days, yeah, we we shot uh, one period of hockey. We shot maybe uh, a quarter and a half of football. And we shot uh, two, three innings of baseball, and that was it. And like, you never went back to the game. Because by the time you, you developed your film and made prints and transmitted three or four pictures, the game was over. Right. It was done. <laughs> exactly. There was no going back. That was one of the hard things about uh, when I was uh, photographing. I used to shoot sports when I was interning, which right. is when I think maybe we met. And it was hard because you're having to transmit these days during the game. And Correct. at a laptop outside during a baseball game or whatever game, and you might miss something, and you just, just or you might get something that in the old days you wouldn't have gotten. So that's it, true. It's a trade-off. That's true. That's you know, very. At very least true. you're still sitting in the uh, the stadium, or sorry, in the photo pit, uh, with your with your uh, potentially uh, uh, your ability to get the picture. So um, an another thing about you is you started your career around the same time as Wayne Gretzky. I did. Uh, and you're we, from Canada also. Correct. He, he started his professional career in 79, and that's when I did mine. And so our careers uh, paralleled. Uh, he retired, what, 10 years ago, and uh -huh. I'm still going on. And yeah. uh, hopefully I'll have a lot more to go. Yeah, and, and what, what you're, everyone's going to end up seeing through these photos, again, these are the old photos. This is, yeah, like, uh, like this is the opening ceremony, uh, Rayford Johnson lighting the, the torch at the L.A. Olympics. L.A. Olympics, that was you a know, minute And ago, L.A.'s now it? in the running for the 2024 Olympics. So. And, and you've been to every Olympics since then? Correct, 17 Are you games. planning to go to Rio? I certainly am. I'm hoping to be you're there, You're hoping yes. to. You're not, uh, not sure yet. Not 100% oh, sure man. yet, but uh, I'm hoping to be Tell there. Tell me a little bit about your love of affair with the Olympics? Well, this, like I say, this was, uh, this was Olympic number one. I, I as, a, as a photographer, I actually went to uh, the Olympics in 1976 as a teenager um, in Montreal. I, I, I was, uh, uh, I bought tickets. I was uh, 17 or 18 years old and I bought tickets to the games. I went for a couple of weeks and I remember getting off the train at the, the, the train station in Montreal from Toronto and I didn't have a place to stay and they had a little hospitality desk at the uh -huh. train station and got a room in an apartment and uh, enjoyed the Olympics. And I fell in love with it, just absolutely fell in love with it. And, and sports has been your thing over the years. I mean, obviously, and as everyone will Correct. see, you are completely, you're really, really great at shooting everything, including just beautiful New York City pictures, which you've been doing the last few years. Right. But um, ha were you an athlete when you grew up? Did you have a certain knack for sports? What was it about sports that, that kept you coming back? Because I find it, Difficulty. I mean, I like it, but it gets you know it right. wears on you. Right. Well, I, I I was a fan. Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, I was as big a sports fan as you could ever imagine. Uh, I was not an athlete in any way. I was a horrible uh, little league baseball player. I played <laughs> a lot of pickup hockey uh, as a goalie, but I and I and I played goal because I didn't want to skate. It was too hard. Oh, you know, really? It was yeah. Too much energy to skate around the ice. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know what? What really uh, got me into sports was um, I, I found out when I started to, sh you know, when I was given the opportunity to shoot my first games, I had a, an unknown ability to follow focus. Oh yeah. I, I don't know why or how, but the hand-to-eye coordination was spot on. As wow. They say. And if a player ran around a football field, or if a, a runner uh, ran a hundred-meter dash at me. All, f all of it would be in focus. Mm -hmm. And how do you know you have that skill, you know, until you try? And, and I never would have known it unless I, I found, you know, I, I happened upon photography in college. Well, I mean, someone like myself, I, I grew up on autofocus. You know, there never was. Right. I, I mean, I, I manual, I shoot with Leicas, and, uh, but every digital SLR, SLR camera I've ever right. owned, I've had an autofocus right. lens. Right, right. Um, do you find yourself ever using... Follow folk or uh, 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 manual focus uh, again? Never, never, never. <laughs> I, I can honestly say that uh, you know I, I, I got a, uh, a story going back to um, going back to the um, 
uh, World Track and Field Championships in Tokyo in 1991, where Carl Lewis uh, won the 100 meters. He came across the finish line. He put his arms out. He celebrated very late, you know, about 20 meters after the finish line. And and I I follow focused it and had a picture that nobody else had. It was you know it was a really nice celebration picture. Uh, one year later, we went to the Barcelona Olympics, mm -hmm. and by then, autofocus came out. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, an autofocus 400. I was actually using an autofocus 70 to 200 uh -huh. at the, uh, the, um, uh, the event in Tokyo in 91. That was the first instance of autofocus. Uh -huh. And in 1992, the picture that I had the year before of him celebrating by myself, basically, by 92, 400 millimeter lenses were out in autofocus, and he did the same thing in the, in the uh, 4 by 100 relay, and 500 of my closest photographer friends had the same picture <laughs> right, of course. as me. And, that and that, you know, I remember walking out of the, uh, the stadium um, that uh, at the end of the Olympics in, in Barcelona in 92 saying, that's it, I'm done. I'm going into management. You know, <laughs> I, the, the, the field has been leveled. You as a, a photographer no longer have have an advantage by having a skill that was better than anybody else. Right. So. Well, that's I, I, just because I've got this picture up here of James Brown in his coffin at the Apollo Theater. I that, was there. I didn't go in. Oh, that was a great day. That was the most surreal day of I, my life. I mean, it was insane. There was this parade. His his um, horse drawn the horse drawn buggy carriage. carriage that was like made of gold. Well, yeah. no, this whole yeah. coffin was pure gold. The, the coffin was like well, it was it was like two tons. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and and he you know you remember he arrived there hours and hours late because the hearse that was driving him up from Augusta, Georgia, broke down because the oh, coffin was too heavy. Too heavy for and it. Yeah, the engine couldn't power it, oh so they ended gosh. up getting there late. But that that was that was what a great day. That was uh, I, you know it's not funny for him. that you know not for him, but uh, <laughs> the the scene out in front of the Apollo Theater, and and I had I had. I had made a pact with myself. I'm going to get inside that theater. Come, you know, hell or high water. I'm going to get in there. Uh -huh. And and I was like the first photographer through the door. Yeah. And they had set up a little roped off area in front of the stage, and I somehow missed that and went right onto the stage, and got as close to the coffin as I could. You know, because I wanted that picture. Did they and know you were a photographer? Or did you? Yeah. Sneak no. No. It? I had all my. No. No. They were. Let, they let in like three or four photographers. Their plan was to let three or four in at a time, go down to the front of the stage, respectively take these pictures. And but it was chaos. Right. You know. And I don't know. I somehow barged my way through the door when they opened it. I went to the stage, and all I remember is Al Sharpton yelling at me, "Get off the stage!" Oh gosh. You know. When as Al I, Sharp as Sharpton I was, starts, yeah. You know. You know this picture that's on the uh, the screen. This was uh, one of my favorites because I'm actually in it. <laughs> So you yeah. put up a remote for this it's one. It's a remote. On this is election night. Barack correct. Obama, obviously. Correct. Um, correct. Look how small the kids were back then. It's crazy. It's yeah. been eight years, and, and it? you know, you know, one little tip as a photographer, um, um, when, you're, when you're going to these events, watch what they do at events before they get to election night. Because this same thing happened at the convention. When right. he walked out in Denver... Remember they did the convention night speech or the last night speech uh, in the stadium, and they had they had lit it so that there were these big shadows, and yeah. and I remembered that. And uh, when we did election night, I tried. I was hoping they would do the same thing. Right. And it, it worked out really well. And, yeah, that's uh, that's really you know, cool. Somewhere in that tent, I'm in back there. Back in the tent, we're all back the on the left side. I'm, and I'm in there triggering the uh, the pocket. Did wizard. you have it in a, like so that you were shooting? The same, so everything you're shooting on your camera. Uh, I triggering. think it was on a foot switch. I usually oh. shoot the pocket wizards on I've a foot switch. Never done a foot switch before. Oh, this was this was uh, amazing. The uh, famous flight that landed in the Hudson Great River, day. which you shot from your office window. Correct, from my desk. You yeah, know, basically, I walked about five feet, and stood <laughs> on a desk, and shot that out the window from the Reuters uh, office building on the 19th floor at uh, 42nd and 7th. Oh my gosh. There was some um, there were uh, gaps in the buildings that uh -huh. I think are no longer there. They've oh, built they up. Oh, they filled them up, yeah. And and all I remember was uh, uh, a person standing up in the newsroom, you know, one of our reporters yelling, there's a plane in the water. Right. And and I grabbed a, a 500 millimeter lens, a camera, a battery, and then I realized I didn't have a disc. Oh, right. I couldn't find a disc. And I ended up finding a disc. Was, I think it was a 250 meg yeah. disc, you yeah, know, yeah. and I got about uh, 40 frames and that was it. The disc yeah. filled up. Yeah. And and it was uh, it was the first picture well, that, that, that hit the wires. It, right. And well, uh, but it's a long way away. And I, I mean, remember it was also way. very, very cold that day. I remember pe people saying, oh, there's a plane. I'm like, oh, it's really cold out, though. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and you know, another part of that story was uh, another, 
you know, very talented photographer, Eric Thayer. Oh, yeah, you he's know, decent. He's very good. Uh, Eric, Eric had come into uh, the Reuter office, and he was sitting at my desk, and we were talking about what to do, you know, what, what should I do with my career? Where should I go with my, 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 my pictures? And <laughs> this thing happened, so he grabbed his camera, he ran down to the river, literally ran down from 42nd and 7th down to the river, and saw a whole bunch of firemen running onto a boat. He just right. ran on the boat with them. And before they, you know, they took off, and before they realized, what well, is this journalist doing on our boat? He was the only photographer on the river, up close and personal. He's got some beautiful photos from with, this. Uh, with this. And we should, I should mention that he, we did a podcast with him um, a few back. So do check out that podcast. We go into right. detail about all, all of his photos. He did a great job. Now, uh, you've also done all sorts of awards and Olympics. And I, I, I know I cut you off earlier That's when we were okay. talking about Olympics. But um, okay. one of the questions that I did have is that, um, you know, how do you keep fresh shooting something at the Olympics when, like you said earlier, you're with 400 of your closest colleagues who are, you know, nearly as good as, you know, the best in the world, sports right, photographers, right. you know? Well, I think, it's, I think it's just a mindset in general. I mean, you could say, how does any photographer keep fresh every day, getting up every day and going out and shooting? But and when you're shooting, that, like, you're I, given a spot, you know? Like, you're what, given a spot. You, you go to your event with the mindset that, you know what, today I'm going to get the best picture. Yeah. And then you have to, you have to work at, at having the best picture. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, you know, always what I did at the Olympics. Uh -huh. And yes, you're sitting, you know, you know, at the 100 meter final, you've got 500 photographers all around you. And, and you know what? Only one's going to have the best picture, mm -hmm. you know, because there's only going to be one angle, you know, that, and, it, you know, being a foot off to the left or right is, or a foot higher or lower or whatever is going to dramatically change the feel of the image. Right. So I always told myself that they're going to look at me and they're going to, you know, celebrate my way and I'm always going to be in that perfect line to the right. athlete. Do you know? Not always, but it, 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 it happens a lot. Know, do you know Dave Black? Uh, I, I of him, certainly, but not, yeah, not certainly personally. not personally, but of uh, working with him around I, uh, Olympics. Yeah. I know he, he's always worked in the uh, Olympic world because he, I think he lives in Colorado and by the training center and all that. And and I remember hearing him talk and and he really like he, before he shoots a like let's say an ice skating right. whatever he'll right. watch he'll go to the rehearsals or the Correct. warm ups yeah. and see where they do things how they do things which I think a lot of photographers don't do and that Correct. And, and it's a lot of. That's that. Is, that's correct. And, and in, in some cases, like the Olympics, a lot of the photographers don't have the opportunity to do it. Uh, you know, for example, uh, this is at the opening ceremony in Vancouver, uh -huh. and I had gone to three dress rehearsals. Oh, I had seen okay, this yeah. three times. So you knew where to be. So, and that comes by working at Reuters. You have a special relationship with right. the IOC, Reuters, AP, AFB, Getty. These are agencies that are part of a pool, and so you sometimes have a bit of an advantage over the general population of photographers working at an Olympic. So, right. so most of the photographers who, who went to the stadium this night had heard that there was going to be this, but they hadn't seen it. Right. Now, you know, Roy, you know I, I was one of probably 10 photographers uh, in the stadium for Reuters uh, this night. I, I picked a position at the side, or I, was, I had a position at the side. We had a lot of photographers in the front, and it was a much better picture from the front where you could see all five rings. Right, right, right. You know, so... Um, no, uh, I think this is a great shot. I, I, I like it. It gives it some depth. So um, this kind of takes us out of our sports world and a little bit more into what you're doing more now. these days. Right. Which is... Stunning New York City See. skyline photos, moonrises, sunrises. Yeah, street photography. Street uh, photography. Just, just you know, New York is the most uh, beautiful city in the world to to be a photographer in. And was and there something that kind of made you change your, you know, what you? I mean, obviously you had taken. I we'll guess we'll probably get into it a, a, a bit know. later, but. You know, tell you know, me about the transition. You know, I, I lived in New York. I moved here in 2005. I, I had always wanted to live in New York. I came to New York, I think, when I was 16 and fell in love with the city on my first trip here. I came, uh -huh. came all the time. I, I, I always, you know, told myself I was going to live in New York. Uh, uh, I ended up living in Washington for 15 years uh, for Reuters, and I, I ended up coming to New York in 2005. And the funny thing is, you know, for the first uh, three, four years, I never looked at the city in the way that I do now. I, I regret not having shot Skyline pictures or, or, or watching the way the sun sets on the city especially and considering it's constantly changing too I mean it changes nightly uh, you know you, you notice new buildings you oh. notice uh, cranes that come and go and uh, you uh, it's incredible and then when you when you match the way the light changes yeah. every night on the city of New York and how it reflects off the buildings it's I mean uh, the, it's you, you made me like uh, so I, I went to the World Trade Center observatory deck recently right and right. I got a really cool picture sun, sunset picture the light was glimmering 
off of Empire State in this crazy yes. way. Yes. And you know, you commented on the photo saying, "Oh yeah, that southern light at this time of year is really great, but from where right. I where I am, it's not very good." And you don't really think about that the different times of the year. You got to exactly. You got to track the light. You know, there's uh, numerous apps. There's you know, the technology is out there to tell you when the sun and the moon is rising, yep. when it when it's rising. They now have uh, these. Uh, uh, I, I love these things. Uh, they're these weather services that predict the sunset now. Oh yeah. You know, on, on the on the uh, the uh, the power of the sunset. Oh how really? Colorful it's how beautiful be. it's going to be. Oh yeah. really? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the, think the one, better one sunsets are usually when there's clouds in the sky. Clouds, you know, and and you look at you know that one of the nicest sunsets was on Sunday last week. It ended up with a double rainbow that I missed because I was underground chasing oh. after the no pants subway the ride. No pants subway ride, of course. Uh, unfortunately, so awesome. Um, okay, so I think we've gone through this. So let's uh, let's back up a little bit, and because uh, because we kind of skipped over how you really got into the, the world of photography. You were, you were a spectator at sports, right? I was. I, I had no interest in photography whatsoever growing up. Uh, it was just not in my world. Um, I, and I, I uh, was given a camera in the summer of 79 by uh, an aunt. It had been an uncle. He had passed away like 20 years before. That camera sat in a drawer. Uh, it turns out she gives me a Leica. It was a Leica M3 double nice. stroke with a collapsible Sumacron 50 millimeter. Oh, cool. Meant nothing to me. Right. It was a Leica. My brother had a Pentax Spotmatic. I was disappointed I didn't get a Pentax. Because it wasn't as big and cool you know, looking right, or something. You know, right, and yeah. uh, I didn't know what a Leica was. It, it meant nothing to me. Right. So anyhow, I, uh, I, I, I go to university. I first, first day at university, I see there's a little ad in the student newspaper that says they're looking for a photographer. So I walked in the door. I wasn't a big fan of school. wasn't very good at it, didn't like it. So I was looking for, I think subconsciously, a diversion away from um, uh, going to class. Uh -huh. And so I went, into the st went into the paper, said, you teach me how to be a photographer, I'll take pictures for you. Three days later, there's a picture in a paper with my name on it. All my friends at school are patting me on the back saying, we saw your picture in a paper. Wow, your name was on it. And I was done. That there's was There's nothing it. cooler than your first published photo. Nothing, nothing at all. And it was a picture of the they were doing a, uh, a story on smoking on campus, and I took a picture of the uh, publisher or the editor of the, uh, the uh, student newspaper with five cigarettes in his mouth. Oh, nice. And that was my first published picture anywhere. Nice. And uh, uh, I proceeded to spend the whole uh, year shooting with that Leica, you know, that range finder. I went to football games. I was shooting football with a 50 millimeter <laughs> range finder. You know, it was like ridiculous. The last football I shot was but, with a Leica and a 50 as well. I, I look back funny. at it and say, it must have helped me, you know, <laughs> figure out how to follow focus because, you know, if you try focusing, a uh, sporting event with a rangefinder, oh, right. with, with that double image that oh, you had yeah. to, you know, you see, line that's up. That's why you were so good at it. You started with a Leica. I started with a Leica, and uh, uh, by uh, by one year, it took me in, in after my in the summer of '78. I started to buy Canons. I, okay, yeah. I realized after my first uh, year of working at the student paper, I was this. This is my field now. This is where I'm headed. Need some uh, some. And so I started buying. Uh, I started buying Canon cameras uh, in the fall of '78. I started freelancing for uh, the Globe and Mail newspaper in Toronto, and a year later, I was uh, working at uh, UPI. And that was when you started your whole wire. Sir, your service with the wire. Correct. I, I, I had my, I remember my first picture was published, was a tennis player uh, at a tennis tournament in Toronto, where it was Marjorie Blackwood. Uh -huh. I don't remember who she was. <laughs> and, and that picture was published in, you know, all the papers across Canada. And it was at that moment that I said, I don't want to work at a newspaper, because if I work at the wire, I can be in all the newspapers. Right. So I remember I as, a, as a high schooler, when I was wanting to get my name in all the papers, I was right. shooting for the local Athens Messenger, and I would notice that all these photos would be AP Photo. That's all it would say. That's all photo. it would say. Yeah. Like, I want to change my name to AP Photo. That was yeah. my big joke. And thinking, yeah, I, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, back then, it, you were anonymous working working for UPI or uh, a Reuters at the yeah, beginning. They you were really, anonymous. They, they said have, Reuters, it said AP. Is that a, a or rather recent UPI. thing that they've started? Yeah, really was, I'd say about uh, 20 years now. Okay. You know, there, there was a massive shift uh, in the publishing world where, where photographers, uh, they realized photographers, you know, should have credit. Right, right. Um, okay, so... Uh, Let's jump over to the photos that you have here from Rio, which you took with a cell phone, was it? Some of them. You know, I, I, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Rio in the last couple of years uh, on uh, planning trips for the World Cup. Uh, 
advanced planning trips for the World Cup, which I was, uh, pl you know, helping Reuters plan. Uh, I also uh, went on a bunch of trips, you know, for the Olympics, planning the Olympics, which are this summer. Right. And uh, last summer, I had a, a dream assignment, uh, you know, working at Flipboard. We had a... Um, we did basically a native ad for Microsoft. They came to us and asking us to uh, promote, uh, they wanted a photographer to go to Rio during the World Cup and, and do a travel log on Rio, but shoot it all on a Lumia 1020 mobile phone. That's the one that had oh, okay. that 40 megapixel okay, camera. Okay, so what were it. your thoughts on that camera? I, I, I loved it, you know, I, I, I was, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a slow and methodical process in using the camera. Uh, it, it writes a big file. It takes a second for it to uh, to allow you to take another picture. Oh, really? But yeah. but these pictures here are all shot on it. The quality was spectacular. They're like 10 meg files. Uh -huh. uh, and I was very, very happy using it. And, and so I noticed they have the Instagram edges. So you were shooting them and posting them to Instagram? And, and I was, I was, I was, uh, we were posting them to galleries on Flipboard and I was also Instagramming them, yes. Gotcha. That's correct. So maybe we can talk a little bit about Flipboard and how you uh, started working there and sort right. of after the role. after I finished at Reuters, I uh, I got this assignment and and I, uh, I I finished up the assignment with the World Cup and then I started working uh, as a photo editor at Flipboard and uh, you know the the you know it was a great place to work you know it's um, it's uh, I was working with Steve Fine, one, yep. of, the, one of the greatest in Who our business. Who was also a podcast uh, on here, check him, few, Steve, like maybe 10 or 15 back. Steve went from uh, Sports Illustrated to Flipboard, and you know, I, I wanted to get out of the print media world and more into the platforms that are distributing, uh, that are controlling the distribution of, of photography now. You know, when you think about where is everybody looking at pictures, they're looking, they're looking at most of the photography they, they consume on platforms, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, uh, whether it's Flipboard, you know, a lot of the, 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 the masses are consuming photography on platforms right and I wanted to get I wanted to see how the platform worked I wanted to see how it's developed how it's you know you know it's just a fascinating you know world to be inside a, a, a Silicon Valley uh, startup yeah and and uh, so can you talk about sort of your role at, how you doing those um, you talk about your role at uh, at Flipboard in but, terms of like what it was that that because uh, it's kind of hard to explain the, the platform to some people. Right, right. You know, it, it, you know, Flipboard, you know, is a, a, a personal magazine platform. Uh -huh. You know, it's also a newsreader. Uh, it allows you to follow your Twitter feeds. You can be logged into your Instagram feeds. You know, it's 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 a multi-purpose platform that gives you access to so much information, and you follow what you're uh, you're interested in. It brings you content, you know, to a magazine or right. to to your feeds. Um, there's also a, a news element called the daily edition. Mm -hmm. And so Steve and I were part of an editorial team, or are part of an editorial team that are. Um, um, creating this uh, photo galleries, you know, big event, uh, you know, uh, galleries, uh, you know, day in, day out. You know, the world has this, this huge appetite for photography. And, and it, it, it's, it's insatiable. Everybody just wants to keep looking at pictures. Right. To me, photography is the backbone of uh, everything uh, on a mobile device. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every, app has a, uh, every app that is distributing content is really based on, on the image. Right, and uh, so recently, um, Apple News Apple has News. come out, which is somewhat similar. It, it has the same premise to deliver content, but it doesn't look quite as nice as Flipboard looks. Right. You know, the, the beauty of Flipboard is they're delivering content in a, in a beautiful environment, you know, in a beautiful setting. You know, you sit there and you just want to engage with it because each flip that you make, you get something new. Right. And, and Apple News is, I, 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 you know, look, I don't have an iPhone. I'm yeah, an you're not user. a big Apple guy. I, I ha I'm not a big Apple guy. Um, I'm more into the Android world. I do have an iPad. I do use it to keep up on the technology and to see the, uh, the platform as, as it uh, compares to, to what uh, uh, I like on Android. So. Uh -huh. And, and I, 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 I got to be honest with you, I have not dived into Apple News. I can't, I can't get into it. I think uh, there are other ways of consuming content that are better than it. Right. Um, okay, so let me uh, pull up your Instagram. So, um, all right, so it's, it's so interesting because you've gone from taking pictures for the, the, the wires right. to, to editing. You were, I, I don't think we even mentioned it yet, but you were like the head of Reuters Photo in America. Correct. I don't know what the exact title is. Uh, picture Editor of the Americas. 
for a while. My last job, <laughs> my last job at Reuters was global sports picture editor. Global sports, okay. Right. So I, I did the gamut. I had, a, you know, there was nothing I didn't uh, plan, organize, cover, shoot, be at. And edit. you were so so it was shooting as well as editing. Correct. Okay. Correct. Did a, you, as I became a manager, it was less shooting. Did you uh, miss it? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. I I always miss shooting. It's still the best job in the world. Yeah. Just to go out with a camera and, and take pictures and. Yeah. Uh, definitely missed uh, missed the shooting. So okay, so um, we're gonna switch over and just start going through this, and we'll continue talking. But yeah, so I, I was gonna say that you know um, it was while I was at Reuters that I f I used Instagram. I got on Instagram in 2012, the summer of 2012, just before I went to uh, London for three months to cover Wimbledon the uh, and the uh, the Olympics, and and it was right in the summer of 2012 that I realized that this was Nirvana. This was a platform where you could shoot whatever you want and publish to it. And a lot of the images that, that were, uh, a lot of the images that, that I was shooting for Insta and putting on Instagram didn't fit on the old wire service mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, the wires weren't into features. They weren't, weren't into pretty pictures. They were into news. They reported on the news. Right. And, and there was a massive transformation in the last, I'd say, five years um, where where the wires uh, driven by clients online, their need for for filling up photo galleries, mm -hmm. and so the wires had a had a had a wonderful transformation. And it wasn't just Reuters; all of them, Getty, Reuters, AP, you know, AFP, EPA, right. they've all been you know looking for content that looks similar to what this stuff is. Right. But when I started, it, it didn't have a place on the wire. And 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 but it did have a place on Instagram. Right. You know this 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 these pictures that people post to Instagram are pictures that the world should see. And, Absolutely. And, it, and it's wonderful to have a platform for that to to uh, to to display this content and to display it as it's happening. You know. So you know. Live, you shoot yeah. a sunset. You know, and it's this just happened. Or it's this, happening. This yeah. is happening. You know. Right. Yeah. You know. You you know. Sunsets last so long. Sometimes you can you can put you know the start, the middle, and the end out. And it's like, this just this is happening, you know, now, you know, and it's as it's as live as say something as Periscope is. And right. and it is uh, it is it's it's fantastic to be able to tap into that kind of distribution right. for your images. And so what is wh when you're shooting uh, for Instagram, I mean you're not shooting for Instagram, you're shooting for yourself, but for your Instagram feed. Correct. Um, Correct. What's the, what's the biggest payoff for you? Is it is it the meeting new people through the medium? Is it gaining followers which is technically distribution you know because the it's it's t it's amazing for me to believe that today i have an instagram feed which isn't near i don't think it's nearly as big as yours or others but right. it's it's bigger than the first new the, the circulation of the first newspaper i worked for right right which is insane which is, it's insane it's great and it's isn't worldwide it? correct so you're connecting with all of these people correct. in different ways and you never know how that is going to Correct. You know, for me, it is. It started out. You know, when I was uh, when I was working in the wires and I was competitive, it was all about getting in print. You know, you you would go cover a football game and you would be in competition with the AP photographer and uh, the Getty photographer. You know, well, Getty wasn't around when I first started, but uh, right. you know, you know, you you were in competition for that that one picture that a newspaper was going to publish. Right. And and for me it was all about winning and losing and actually getting published. Right. I want people if I cuz you're anonymous at the wire. You you put out all these pictures and you're at the mercy of an editor at a newspaper or uh, you know a publishing, you know, house like a, a magazine or whatever. You're you're at their mercy to actually show your work to the public. And if they don't you went to the game and nobody saw what you did. For right. me, it was like, wow, that's not good. Right. So I, I was fascinated with Flipboard because, or not Flipboard, I mean uh, Instagram because you're self-publishing. Right. Now people can see your pictures. Right. And they are out there. You and you're your own editor. You're your own editor and, and you are giving people the opportunity to see what you're doing. Okay. And, and that's where it really, it really resonated with me. Now, um, I, you know, I want to talk a lot with you about social in general um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a whole new ballpark, you know. It's, it's a great platform for us to do things, although there are some, some issues with it, like rights and, you know, what are, we, what are we giving away as uploaders to these different services? And um, it's, it doesn't seem like it's being talked about so much anymore. 
these issues, but I guess last year, the yeah. previous years, there's been these issues with, well, technically, with how we're what we're agreeing to, right? We're kind of giving away our rights to these platforms. We we are. We how are, do you feel? How do you feel We are giving away that? our pictures, and and you you uh, have to find alternative ways to sell the material that you're creating or the you know the pictures you're creating um, uh -huh. I'm a contributor to Corbis so a lot of my Instagrams are going into the Corbis archive uh -huh. uh, Corbis images are and you selling Instagram photos so they, they sell some. Corbis and stuff yeah you know look at all, all my Instagrams are shot on real cameras okay you know, I can count on one hand the number of pictures I've ever shot so I used to call that insta fraud Insta fraud. I used to call it Insta fraud. Insta fraud, but, but, and uh, but yeah. now I've been like, okay, I'm seeing how so many people are actually, it's, you know, give it up. I'm just, it's got to it be a platform. So give it up. I you know, there used to be, uh, you know, you, you you've touched on one of my, you know, biggest pet peeves, is the Instagram account that says iPhone only. Right. What does that mean? I you know, and why is uh, why are you pointing out to me that it's iPhone only? Are you asking me to look at your work? and pat you on the back because you used a phone to take your picture? Or are you asking me to look at your work and give you a pass because the technical quality is not as good on all your images as it could be if you shot with a real camera? I so would say technically both. <laughs> both of those things. You know, and, and have we not got to the point where, where the device is incidental? At this point period? it is, it really is. Doesn't yeah. matter, iPhones shoot great photos, uh, Samsung phones shoot great photos, Everybody's in it to make a great photo, and it's really about the picture for me. Right. I, I don't need to know what you shot it on. I don't care what you shot it on. Right. I care that you took the time to share it with me. Right. And that's all I want. Oh, stunning you photo. Know. The depth in your, one of the things you, you really are, are great at is, is creating a lot of depth. It's not just a beautiful skyline. There's, there's foreground, middle ground, background. Layers. Many, many layers. And Somebody light. somewhere taught me layers yep. and, and, the, and the power of layers in a photograph. Yep. And, and, and so you try to use uh, techniques. You know, you go through my Instagram feed, you'll find, you'll find, uh, you'll find a few things like uh, layers are big. Obviously, silhouettes are big, yep. and and like in that last picture, I'm constantly looking for the faceless single person striding through the city of New York. Right. I'm trying to place people here by themselves. Right. And so there's a few themes, you know. You, you know and if you're going to if you're going to keep up with a um, a successful or or uh, uh, I don't know what to describe it as, uh, you know, to to get up in the morning and and continually go out on your way to and from work, because 90% of the pictures that I'm posting on Instagram are taken to and from somewhere, yeah. rather than going out to specifically shoot that image. Uh -huh. um, you know, to do that, you have to, you have to, you got, you got to have a few themes. You can't be helter skelter, right. you know? And, and I like, this is another example of the themes that I do. I like scale and perspective. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I like to play like with that scale. that first photo, the, the bird, bird the eating bird. Uh, the Empire State Building. Massive bird. A bird in Hoboken and a big building across the river in, in Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah. And so you play with depth of field, you play with scale, you play with perspective, you play yeah, with contrasting color. Contrasting light and Contrast. Color. You know, there's a lot of things. You know, there's, there's you know, probably six or seven different things. Here's another one that, that illustrates uh, perspective. Right. You know, um, uh, as, uh, you know, well. So So um, one of the things that you spoke about in our last, your last talk, and I want to address in this podcast, which was sort of an interesting uh, point you pointed out, was that you don't watermark any of your photos with any kind of like, you know. I don't. Gary Hirshhorn. Yeah, I, I don't. You know, and, and you'll notice uh, if you go through Instagram, 99.9% .9 of the people don't. Uh, it's my general belief that uh, watermarking is uh, sort of against the the uh, mantra of Instagram. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, look at people do it, and and I understand why people do it, and and I think it's in in you know if you believe in it, you should do it. But uh, I'm I'm I I've just never been a watermarker, and I get yelled at and by John Harrington all the time. <laughs> and, <John. laughs> I get, and he's right. You know, John is like the uh, the the champion of all. Uh, you know, photo rights for for especially freelancers. Right. And, uh, he's absolutely spot on correct. And well, I've I've personally had some you know copyright issues that has right. you know gotten into legal cases and stuff. And and uh, you know I I I have decided I think it was maybe almost a year ago, not even a year ago, but to make sure to to put just a, a little watermark at the bottom, just mm -hmm. in case it gets ripped off, that that it shows that. 
this is where it was originally it really originally came from. Right. Are you against? Are, are you against? I mean, I understand. I see some people who do their watermarks right in the middle or around. It's very obnoxious. Right. But even like subtle. No, subtle, subtle ones. Are, you know, like say, I don't. I personally don't unfollow somebody because they watermark a picture. Mm -hmm. But I believe a lot of people in the Instagram community do unfollow people when right. the image is watermarked. Right. There was one case I I, uh, I photographed a famous Instagrammer, Viner guy, mm -hmm. one of like the biggest, right? Literally. And he, I took a picture, posted it to my Instagram yep. and I put a tiny little copyright at the bottom and he was like, I'm going to repost it. Can you please send me the original so that I can? And I sent him a full rest with the little copyright I, and yes. he ends up not posting. He's like, oh, you know, I think he was trying to just get me to send it without the watermark. Right, right, right. right. Um, so I probably lost out on a couple million people seeing one of my photos. Right. I guess. Right. And potential but, whatever, because he didn't want my watermark. But he didn't ask me to take it off or anything like that. But I, I do. I do see that some people are, are weird about it. But they're, they're, it's, it's, it's one of those little things in the Instagram community. And, yeah. Uh, um, I, you know, like I say, if you if you feel strongly about watermarking, you should. Right. You absolutely should. And now, uh, when you post a, a Instagram, for me, for instance, I end up usually posting, posting it to Instagram, and it goes to my professional f Facebook page, my right. personal Facebook page, and my Twitter. Do right. you do that same sort of thing? Yeah, I, I um, not everything I put on Instagram goes to Twitter. You know, only the stuff that I, I genuinely really like. Mm -hmm. uh, or if it's associated with some sort of uh, newsy event, uh, I will um, uh, send that over to Twitter. I, I share some of it to Facebook. I try not to clog my Facebook feed with too many of my pictures, you know, day in, day out. Uh, I, 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 if you want to look at what I do, go look at it on Instagram. And, and, and like I say... Um, there are some things that I do that I like to share because, you know, you got a lot of friends, you know, and you've got friends who were at the same event maybe that you were at. And we all kind of get into this little friendly competition of, sure. you know, who uh, who had the best stuff today. Well, you uh, you were talking about Thayer before. Correct. And Josh Lott, I Josh think, Lott, started yeah. the first original Insta, Insta, what do you call it? Insta match or? Insta meet or, oh, no, they're, they're Insta match. Yeah. Insta where competition they, where correct, they were like a, a. Correct. They went to the same place and, uh, right. and had a competition and, as and to I, who shot it better. I was the, so impressed with that. I was just so yeah. jealous. I was like, oh, man, I got to start doing these competitions between people. I they started for a while. while they got a lot of, uh, uh, they got a lot of PR on that. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. a great idea. And, 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 you know, that's, that's what it takes. It takes great ideas to, to get people to, to see your work. So uh, another thing, as I'm noticing, some of your photos are going from square to a little more horizontal. Um, and in your past uh, talk, we someone brought up a question about how most of your old photos were verticals. Correct. And so I want you to talk a little bit about that transition from back then and why we've gone from different formats and, and right. We, and we, even we, even here when we're looking at your, your Instagrams. Yeah. Well, we uh, we started out in the news business, I think, where where we were we were fitting holes on uh, a printed page. A lot of front pages of newspapers were, were very much vertical and um, were very much you know, in a vertical. Uh, and you, you, you also, you know, way back when you knew what the hole was going to be because the, the event sometimes dictated it. You know, for example, if you covered the um, uh, pre presentation of the Stanley Cup, uh -huh. The Stanley Cup is raised over a player's head. Right. It's a vertical picture. And every newspaper in Canada would hole would leave a hole that was vertical for that picture. First right. one in, first vertical on the wire. So if you went and put out a horizontal first, you didn't get the front page of the paper. Right. So um, as the internet, you know, came in, and I remember, you know, the, my first real uh, remembrance of publishing to the internet was around the uh, Olympics in 1998, when we were in Nagano, and MSNBC was pretty much the 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 biggest kid on the block in news publishing on the internet. And, and we were all, all fighting over how to get our pictures into MSNBC. And they were, they were really about um, uh, horizontals. The, the web is a horizontal publishing platform. Uh -huh. There is no question about that. You know, computer screens are horizontal. They are not vertical. And so the web, you know, published to the horizontal format. And so the wires, uh, and I was a big proponent, you know, as an editor at a wire, uh, making sure that our photographers were sending vert or sort of were sending horizontals first didn't outlaw verticals as people sometimes say I did, 
but I, I, I just said I outlawed sending verticals first. Uh huh. And and um, because if you if you did, you lost. Right. You know, if if the World Series was won, if the Super Bowl was won, you know, if that that moment of celebration that everybody's looking for was published in a vertical pl- in a vertical format first. I guarantee you every time MSNBC, the New York Times, you know, every every online publisher went with the first horizontal they got. Right. So and all the galleries. How many verticals do you see in galleries? The odd one, you know, yeah, but, there but are odd the odd ones, one. But, but it really it's somewhat so much smaller, you know. Right. Yeah. And and then as as monitors grew, you know, as as IMAX went to twenty seven inches and platforms like uh, the big picture, you know, from Boston right. or Alan Taylor's uh, galleries at the Atlantic now, um, um, they started publishing these pictures in higher res, and the, that meant that they could fill the 27 inches. Right. And and so nobody wanted to look at vertical. Right. They wanted to see uh, they wanted to see horizontal. So uh, now um, the world moved to Instagram. You know, Instagram started in 2000. Now we got squares, and I happen to love the square format. Yeah. I thought the square format was was fabulous. But almost every picture I ever posted on Instagram. I saw the square in the horizontal. Mm-hmm. So if you go back to my original frame, you'll probably find it in Corvus as a horizontal. Oh, okay. You know, so you would or, upload or, them to or, Corvus or, or, as Back the then, full it was during Reuters. So when you uploaded them to Corvus, you would upload the original files. Well, correct. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and back when I started Instagram, I, was at, I, wasn't at, I wasn't putting it into Corvus. I was putting it into uh, Reuters. Right. Right. And so um, uh, we did a number of galleries, for example, of the, of the um, uh, Instagram pictures I was shooting, but we did them in the horizontal format right. because the picture was shot as a horizontal. And, and, na- and now have you been, you, I see that there's more horizontals because Instagram's allowed us to do that. Yeah, absolutely. When, when Instagram, when Instagram opened up, you know, publish as you like vertical or horizontal or square. Almost horizontal, almost, almost vertical. Yeah, it's yeah, not it, quite the, the proportions. Know, yeah. It, 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 it'll, it, 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 I started to take advantage of that, and and I'll I'll be honest with you, um, uh, you know one of the big things on Instagram is people like to repost your pictures. You know there are there are uh, collectives. You know one right. of my favorites uh, is what I what I saw in New York, mm. and and they run really uh, they, they 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 search Instagram looking for the best pictures. They give you nice credit, get you more followers. You know I I'm I'm more than happy to let them repost. The, the images, but if you post a horizontal, they don't repost horizontals. They keep it as a square. Oh, I see. So you know, it, so you you, you got to make sure that you're you know. I I try to publish most of my Instagrams in the square format, but it's it's impossible to to stick to that because there are just, be, you know, because they've given you the opportunity to do the horizontal, you can't discount. You know, sometimes a nice picture gets butchered by making it a square. Right. Right. You have no choice. So. Um. Let's see here. Uh, Goodness, I had something on my tip on the tip of my tongue, but I but I missed it. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what should we what should we switch to here? Um, what yep. so who did you have any when you would look mentors, mentors, mentors. in general from mentors from the early great. days to the right. shooting days to the Instagram days? Right, mentors, uh, mentors is everything. You know, I, I think every photographer has uh, a story about uh, the one person in their life that really brought them into into uh, their career as a photographer uh-huh. and, and I, I, I I'm no different I had um, uh, the photo editor at United Press Canada when I started was uh, a man named Bob Carroll uh-huh. uh, Bob and I are still great friends you know we still talk all the time and we talk photography and Bob's retired and had a great great career at UPI as a photographer photo editor uh, worked at the Toronto Sun Canadian Press Windsor Star I mean all these 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 great media outlets and and Bob was the kind of guy who, who um, uh, steered me in the right direction. If, I, I don't feel I would have ever been in this career without him, mm-hmm. right? I owe everything to him. You know, he's the guy that when I walked in the door with, um, with uh, 28 by 10 black and white prints in an envelope as a portfolio and said, hey, you got a job? And, and he said, no, but, uh, you know, you can come and hang out if you like which is what I did and that's where I got my start at United Press back mm-hmm. in the summer of 1979 and it was it was his mentorship uh, the first time I ever shot something uh, sorry the first film he ever looked at was this tennis picture that I was talking about this Marjorie Blackwood at the Canadian Open Tennis Tournament uh, I came up there with like three rolls of film one frame had a picture of a tennis player with a ball in it uh. didn't know what I was doing I uh. went up there and uh, they didn't ask me to cover it I, I noticed that they weren't there 
and so I went uh, down to the office with this film and said, Bob, you want to take a look? And he found one frame. That was it. It happened to be waist up, nice and tight, ball, racket, head, all next to each other. That was the only frame. He sat me down. We went through the film. He said, this is what you got to do tomorrow when you go back. Yeah. And I came back with three or four rolls of film. Every frame had a ball in it. Yeah. And I feel that was really, uh, that was the aha moment. Right. People can teach you how to do this. Experiences, experience is uh, you know, everything. Everything. It's everything. You know, to me, it's everything. You know, um, um, I, I've always believed that photography. Um, you know, certainly, what separates the great photographers from the good photographers is you have a you have an eye. You see things that other people don't. But for the most part, I've always believed that photography is a tech a, a technical skill. You know, whether it was being able to follow focus better than somebody else, mm -hmm. or whether it's uh, an ability to. Uh, just use the technology, you know, and, and, and look at a lot of the, the pictures that you see on Instagram now. It's, it's um, uh, the technology of the camera, the things that Sony and Canon are building in, whether it's HDR or whether it's Adobe and how they build the tools into Lightroom that mm -hmm. make your pictures pop and bring out shadow detail. You know, that's not the photographer. That's the technology that is making those images uh, have a wow factor. Right. And... And I've always believed that, that photography is a very teachable uh, profession. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if, if I take a photographer, if I take a young photographer, and I talk to them about how to cover a football game, uh, I believe that they will come out of the game with usable with usable sure, material, yeah. you know, especially you know, now that we have uh, autofocus, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. It may have been a little different before uh, autofocus came along. But in the autofocus world, the technology helps photographers be better. Yeah. And, and it also extends careers. It makes, you know, you know, photographers better longer. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, you know, fabulous. You know, what could be better than, than a great photographer that still shoots 30, 40, 50 years after they first picked up a camera? Mm -hmm. And and then you get people like David Burnett who, who reach back to the technology, right. you know, 50 years ago to make pictures today. But which is interesting because as we go back to that question which was how how do you stand out from the rest of the pack he did it that one year by just changing his format completely Correct. and shooting one frame every minute right. rather than right 40 exactly. frames a second exactly and and you know you find that niche you find that that thing that nobody else is doing mm -hmm. but but um, I, I owe everything to Bob you know he taught me he he told me that the biggest the biggest um, lesson he taught me was understand what you're photographing and and reach in and get it don't waste your time on the things that don't matter and focus on what does matter so basically what he was saying was be a journalist you know as, as you approach a game read the game notes before the game read whatever you can understand if there's a milestone that might come up in tonight's you know game um understand you know if you're going to cover a debate who the best you know who the players are like last night trump and cruz right. if you were at that debate last night you know I'm, i haven't looked at you know the, the papers or or, or uh, media this morning but i guarantee you everything was about trump and cruz right and their angry exchange so if you're at that event you have to pick up on that yeah and be the journalist no okay it's happening the news moments here yeah and, and that's what he taught me and that's what i always have tried to pass on to uh, all the uh, photographers I worked with at Reuters. That's awesome. And sometimes I got into trouble because a lot of people said, you predetermine as, a, as an editor or a boss, you predetermine what's going to be important. Oh, or yeah. you predetermine your edit. And then when you go and edit, you're looking for what you think is the biggest moment. And, it, and that isn't always that way. You know, and sometimes I was a bit closed-minded in, 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 in um, but that comes, that goes all the way back to the beginning of, of how I was uh, taught and mentored. Right. There are moments. There are There's moments. a moment in a game that is where the game is won or lost. You know, think back to last Sunday or last weekend's football games. You know, there was uh, uh, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. You know, you're out there in the rain covering the game all game. And on the, literally the last play of the game, there's a 30-yard Two penalties for 30 yards that puts Pittsburgh in field goal range to kick a field goal and win the game in the last play of the game. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else in the game that mattered. Right. You know, but that was another thing I hated about shooting that is something would happen that would trump everything that you've done in the past of that game. Same as when a game goes to overtime. Right. You know, um, nothing that happened in the regular game mattered. But, you know, that that if you're a photographer at that game, you've got to be in the moment. You've got to be recognizing that this is all anybody's going to publish right. or talk about. And I'm not sure that happens as much as it should. Right. You know, and, and, and yes, there are galleries that, that show 20 pictures and this is how the game developed. But the front page 
is the play. Yeah. You know, the penalty that caused, you know, the play that caused uh, Cincinnati to get 30 yards, you know, uh-huh. uh, 30 yards in penalties. So, yeah. and, you know, the same thing with, um, um, what was it, uh, uh, Seattle, Minnesota, where the, the, the Minnesota kicker shanked a field goal in the last play of the game. You know, there was nothing else that happened in the game that mattered. Right. You know, and I, you know, when, I, when I'm, uh, you know, building a gallery uh, of that game, I'm going right to that play. Right. You know, I'm going right to that play. Right. You know, and another instance was uh, Monday night at the um, at the um, college championship. You know, think about that game and think about what what was the play. You know, anybody who watched the game, it was an onside kick. Right. You know, and you know what? There were no pictures of it. Oh yeah, because no one was expecting it. <laughs> no one yeah. was. Ex- it was just totally unexpected. Right. You know, and and unfortunately there were no pictures of it, but. But that, you know, you got you to be in the moment. You know, if you're going to be at an event, and it doesn't matter whether you're, you're at uh, the Oscars or a Super Bowl or a regular season game or a press conference, there's a moment that right. matters more than any other moment. Right. You know, that the person you're photographing is, is, is in, in that moment. You got you to find it. So I think we've gone over a ton of stuff, and I have just a few more questions for you. Um, but... With all of these beautiful photos that you've taken of New York, your careers, your career has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Correct. You're sort of in transition now. Correct. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you have any thoughts of what your, what kind of plans or what would you like to do? Do you have any thoughts of maybe publishing a book with these, doing a gallery? Like, I'd yes. love to chat with you about that. Uh, definitely. Any way I can, of course. But no, I mean, no, definitely. You know, um, I've had more than enough people say, you know, when are you going to put out a book on New York, you know, of your New York pictures? Yeah. And, or when are you going to do a book just on your moon rises, right. or moon sets, you oh, know, man. and your fascination with the moon? Um, uh, I would love to do it, yes. I, I, and maybe this is the year that I will kind of do the edit uh-huh. and get it together. Um, I've been thinking about the fine art world, how to get into it, how to get pictures uh, on gallery walls. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be a, a, a dream. Yeah. You know, there's no question. Uh, I've given you know pictures away to uh, 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 charity auctions, and, and they've done well. I know that they've done well. You know, and it would be nice to um, uh, be able to provide this content to people who really want to buy it. Right. I've never investigated that at all. So interesting. But I think the time has come. But I also think you need to have a bit of a body of work. You can't just go out and shoot for a couple of weeks and say, "Okay, I'm ready for a gallery." You know, I've I've been shooting New York now for you know the better part of you know say four years, four or so years, and and uh, I, I think I've I can put together you know 20 pictures that I'm really proud of of. Uh, of uh, the city of New York and how beautiful this place is. Well, I'm really excited to see that. And um, as I as I bring up your your Instagram page, I, I mean, everyone should be checking out your Instagram page and following you because just a daily dose of beautiful New York City. Um, I follow you on Facebook, and I, I regularly see that. I see yeah. so many people sharing your photos. Yeah, I got a few fans Facebook. out there. Yeah, I mean, that, that are tagging you in it or mentioning you, and you know how Facebook is. It brings up your... Absolutely. Uh, your your yes. thing on my news feed when somebody mentions you and all Absolutely. that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that that's uh, really, really cool that, that you've built up. And let's see, how many? 76,000 followers. I mean, that's awesome. I yeah, mean, that's great. Well, you know, uh, you know I, I think uh, um, Sasha Lekka was, uh, was, was talking a little bit about this last week, and I was applauding him uh, highly last week when he said, it's a fake number. Uh-huh. Right? It's a fake number. I, I've been on their suggested follower list twice. You know, when you're on that list for 14 days, you get about close to 5,000 followers a day. Yeah. Uh, and then when you get off the list, uh, I'm still, you know, I was on it a, a couple of months ago. The first thing that happens, you know, uh, when you get off the list is you start to lose followers. And, and the, the, the number is about 5,000. And right now, I'm at exactly 5,000 fewer followers than I was at the top. Really? Yeah. So, you know, people people follow you and then they unfollow and then after. they unfollow you. People who sign up for Instagram oh, and they believe see it or it. not, a lot of people sign there up are still it. millions of people, you know, getting on Instagram every day every for day. the first time. Yeah. And so when you open up a new account, they give you a long list of people that they Suggested. suggest that you follow. And so a lot of people are clicking on all of them. Do you know how you got on that list? Uh, no, they pick you. Uh, just they, they, you just get an email out of the blue that says you're now on the list. Have and you and if you're ever interested in knowing who's on the list at any given time, go to Instagram, the Instagram account, you uh-huh. know, follow Instagram, and under followers, who they're following, um, if you go to see, that right now they have 257 people on their, 
on their suggested follower list. Oh, so, so their their suggested follower list is their followers. Is their followers? Okay, correct. That is correct. Or their fault. The people they're following. The people they're following are their suggested uh, follower list. Okay. So that is how uh, that is how uh, you know and and you know you just all of a sudden one day you open up your Instagram feed and it says like you have. 300 new followers and it's like oh I'm on the list again yeah. and you go check to see who they're following and yeah you're on you the list you get like a little alert saying you get, you know, a, you get an email from them that oh, okay. says that uh, have you ever done anything else with them in terms of like uh, other than just being featured uh, I have not okay I have not but the, you know the, you know, look at the, the thing you know you, you the thing that I'm more interested in in the, in the Instagram world is you, the engagement and and the the number of likes you get because um, you're really working and posting pictures for the people that are going to like your pictures. And for me, I have a pool of about of that seventy seven thousand. There's about twelve hundred people that actually will take the time to like a picture. Right. And the other, you know, seventy six thousand would never even hit like. And so, last question before, unless anyone else has a, any questions, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get to you. But uh, any any bit of advice to photographers that are getting into this industry now? I mean, you you got into it. 30, 40 years ago, things totally different. Now you're doing totally different things. I mean, your advice is totally going to be totally different. So what are your thoughts now toward, towards anybody, whether it be someone in your age bracket getting out of the staff world, getting into the, the world of photography, or being a young up-and-comer? Well, well, first, have a social media presence. You know, people, people find you because you're on Instagram, you're on Twitter, you're on LinkedIn, you're on Facebook, you're using the platforms. Um, um, you know, cross-pollinate yourself. Uh, make sure that uh, um, if you have uh, a photography magazine on Flipboard, make sure you tweet out of it and that people know that you're, you're on Flipboard and that there's another place mm -hmm. that your pictures are being published. Um, uh, don't be afraid of social media and don't be afraid of uh, posting images and letting people see them and not being paid for it. Um, I mean, we all need to make money. We all, we, well, we, we all have to have an income. Um, and, and I know that when I, when I talk about uh, putting unwatermarked images up and then having uh, pictures go on Twitter and then NBC News takes them and, or ABC News takes them or, you know, somebody publishes them, they, they do ask permission. You right. know, they do ask permission. But, but you know, I, 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 if you say no... You don't get published, your work doesn't get seen, and somebody else does. Right. Because there's always somebody else that's going to say yes. Can you give me an example of, um, I mean, I have examples if you don't, but ways that Instagram has gotten you work or led to something, this, that, or another, that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for your posting on Instagram? Um, I, I can't honestly say I've used my Instagram feed to try and get work. Um, I, I will say that uh, the assignment that I shot on the phone in Brazil for Microsoft, probably my Instagram feed probably helped uh, uh, the ad agency that was making the decisions on doing this to use me because because they liked the pictures that I was uh, posting there. That's another thing I've heard is that like some people, I've heard some people talking on uh, photo business forums on Facebook right. saying this ad you know agent guy or whatever contacted me or i ran into this person we were talking about it. he wanted to see my work and he didn't ask for a portfolio he's like yeah, let me know what your instagram correct. account is correct they'll just ask for your instagram account rather than your and, real portfolio and and that you know to me is you know, uh, you know going back to the advice that you're saying keep your inst if you're a photographer keep your instagram feed professional right there's no social media aspect you know no social aspect i should say to my instagram feed there's no selfies there's no uh no pictures of what i'm doing or where i am Th there are pictures of what i'm doing you can tell what i'm doing you right. know you can tell on any given day you can see where gary is you know so you're giving your location away and you're giving away what you you're, you're doing today but right. um but i'm not you know i'm not sh i'm not using instagram as a social uh tool i'm right. using it as a, a professional tool to show people this is, you know, what I uh, photograph. Right. Well, Gary, um, I really appreciate your time. Unless there's any anyone out in the audience, any questions from the audience? Oh, got one. Go ahead, shout it out. Hi. I wanted to know if I can take the pictures on the street and open up, you know, this will be, uh, what I don't know, uh, suit me, for example? They won't sue you. <laughs> the no. question was, well, Yes, in in the U.S., if you're out in public, it is legal. 
There are other countries around the world, especially Germany, for example, where it is highly illegal to photograph people without their permission. Oh, I didn't know that about Germany. In I was France. in Germany uh, uh, a year ago, and I had a woman chase me down the street, really? demanding that I delete the pictures that I took of her. So, oh, wow. Um, one more question. Yeah. They might. They might repost them if they like them. Well, <laughs> there, there's nothing you can do. Once you, if, if, you know, you, if you use Instagram, you have to use Instagram with the idea that if somebody likes your picture, they're going to either repost it. They may not publish it in a magazine or something like that, but they may repost it and use it on their feed. They usually give you credit. But you can't, you can't use a, a platform like Instagram or Twitter without the expectation that somebody might use your image. You can go private, yeah. right? You can have a pr you can make your account private, but if you do that, then nobody sees your work. But but Only the people that you give access to. You could also technically go after some of the people if you wanted to. You can have a watermark on your on your image, which might prevent people from copying it if it says your copyright information. But but you know it's yeah. it's and it really comes down to if somebody is is taking your work and and uh, making money from your work. That is a copyright infringement. Absolutely. If somebody's taking your picture and reposting it to another feed, what are you going to do? Right. You know that that you you look at it as a way to expand your your audience and the number of followers that you have. Question over here. Yeah. Yes. Well, you. Know, well, it, it, it the question is about this photo and how crisp and beautiful. And this is coming from a non-photographer. Right. Well, it, it is the equipment. It's not just that, but all the pictures that came up there. Right. It's the equipment. The, the, it's, 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 it's the difference between using, um, uh, say, a mobile phone, an iPhone or uh, uh, any mobile phone, versus using um, uh, a professional piece of gear with, uh, uh, this was shot probably with a 300 millimeter lens. So you're, that's the whole frame. It's full frame. It's not cropped at all. That's how it was shot. So that's why it's so uh, clear and crisp. And you use the Photoshop to correct uh, You know, look at everybody. Everybody uses Photoshop to uh, crop in, to um, adjust a little bit of the color balance. Not every every picture gets recorded as uh, in the in the color tone that it it should that it looked like. And that's about it. A little bit of uh, contrast, a little bit of... Um, and he's that. also from the photojournalism world, so heavy in the ethics world uh, area. Absolutely. Especially being from, you know, the wires. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you, you don't manipulate an image by adding or subtracting um, uh, content. That's right. That's right. I don't like it. No. <laughs> it's like I, I saw a picture on... Uh, Instagram yesterday of the skyline in New York with the Milky Way. You oh, know, and yeah. it was like, it was beautiful. I mean, it was like this stunning image, but like, I don't think anybody uh, actually that's didn't two look photos for sure. Yeah, didn't, didn't happen, you know, you know, so. Well, um, everyone can go to, uh, I guess, Instagram to see your, your website, Correct. which is now Instagram. So just Instagram.com slash Gary Hershorn. Correct. And, uh, is it, do you have GaryHershorn.com? No, no, I have it, but uh, there's nothing on it. Probably uh, just goes I, to I use uh, Instagram as uh, the calling card. Yeah, thank you. Um, My pleasure. So, thank you, um, thank you to uh, Adorama again, Adorama.com slash events. Please, if you liked this uh, podcast, um, you can check out all our other events. Subscribe to our YouTube page, Photo Brigade on YouTube. I'm sure there's a little somewhere in the corner of the screen here. You can click subscribe. Um, thank you again to Canon Professional Services. Temba Bags, and most importantly, Gary Hershorn. Thank you. Thanks again for being part of this. Um, again. Thank again, you. again. <laughs> and thanks, everyone, for coming out. Uh, and we'll thank see you, you again next time. Cheers, everyone.